This morning comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 3, verses, or through the first verse of chapter 4. It's a story that we have told recently in our sanctuary, but this is a different version of it. And if you're worried you may not notice the differences, I invite you to open your pew Bibles to page 836 and follow along with me. But this is how the, the script, the text, the story goes. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather girdle around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious leaders of their day, when John saw them coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit that befits repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, his winnowing fork in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Fire. Emphasis, mine. <laughs> We're going to pause right there. That's not the end of the story, but we have to pause. Because what you have to realize is this is what John was preaching for an untold amount of time. Okay? From, the, from what we read in this story, all of Judea, an entire country of people, were coming to him in waves to be baptized in the river. So who knows how long he was preaching these things, but it must have been a very long time. And it was really very dire teaching, wasn't it? It was very angry and wrathful. And he talked a lot about one who is mightier than I coming to do the next thing. And that thing's going to happen so that God, who is ultimately in power and in charge, is going to come through and raise the earth, clear it of all wickedness. John had a very particular view of how the whole cosmos worked and how God's power worked and his place in the whole thing. He said, oh, I'm speaking to the poor, the outcast, the downtrodden. They're under my care. And then there's the one mightier than I. And then there's God, who is mightier than that. He had it all worked out. He knew exactly what was going to happen. Except he didn't. <laughs> As we're about to read, when he met the one who is mightier than himself... There was no wrath, there was no winnowing fork, there was no fire. This is what happened instead. Picking up in chapter 3, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And when Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved with whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's a quick story with very little punctuation. And so it might be easy to miss. But there's a moment in this story 
when John the Baptist's entire worldview is shattered. His understanding of what he had dedicated his whole life to gets blown away. He really thought he had it all worked out. And who could blame him? He saw how the world was organized. He saw how the temple worked. The temple worked like this. There is the Holy of Holies, the inner chamber of the temple, where God lives, and no one is allowed to go in there or look in there. And underneath that, there were the priests who ran the office of the temple, who took sacrifices from folks so that they could be forgiven for their sins, forgiven for everything that they did wrong. But if you couldn't pay... If you couldn't pay the tax, if you didn't have animals to offer for the sacrifice, you weren't welcome in the temple. And if you were a woman, you weren't welcome in, on the inner chambers of the temple. And if you weren't Jewish, or if you weren't clean, if you had a body that didn't work right, you weren't allowed to go past what we call the beautiful gate. And then somewhere down here were all the other range of people who had come to be baptized by John in the river. John knew it. He saw how this whole system worked. There was this hierarchy of power, and he wanted to challenge it. And he looked around, and he saw that they were occupied by the Roman Empire. And that was even easier to see how it worked. There is Caesar, who is God on earth. And then underneath Caesar were Roman politicians and citizens. And way beneath that were the occupied people of Israel, common Jews. And even among them, there were different levels of power. Some of them were tax collectors helping receive money for the empire. So they had certain privileges and power. And further on down, there were all these folks who couldn't afford to live life on their own terms anymore. And so John was gathering them down by the river. So who can blame him for thinking that the way the temple worked and the hierarchical, hierarchical ways of the Roman Empire, who could forgive him for thinking that God worked the exact same way? That there was God, the one ultimately in charge, who would eventually cleanse the earth of all the wicked people. And underneath God was the Messiah, the chosen one who was going to come and be God's warrior, who was going to lead the charge and baptize the people with fire. And then right underneath, maybe eh, right underneath them, was John... And John said, I am doing the Lord's work, preparing the way, and here's all the people who are beneath me. Who could blame him for thinking that? And yet, when he met Jesus, the one who he thinks he is not worthy of holding Jesus' sandals, Jesus says, you baptize me. He had to be shook. <laughs> His whole life was put into question right there on the spot. He's so blown away that he tries to challenge Jesus. He tries to question Je uh, Jesus, Lord, Master, Savior of all people, the one begotten Son of God of the cosmos. Let me tell you how this works. <laughs> you baptize me. <laughs> and then I keep baptizing all these other lesser people. And then eventually God comes by and spares us and kills everybody else. You know, how the come on, Jesus, get with the program. He must have been so embarrassed, so scared, so worried, so devastated to find out that righteousness is not something that one particular person can earn. Righteousness is not something that one particular person can be. Righteousness is something that has to be fulfilled. The word itself, righteousness, literally in our language, literally means the right way. John thought he knew the right way. He thought he knew how this was all going to work. And Jesus came in and said, no, no. We could do it your way. Sure, I could baptize you and then God can come pour down the fire. And then our community and our way of life will just be a carbon copy of every other form of human life you've ever seen. We can go to battle with the Roman Empire and we'll just have two different hierarchies operating in tandem. We could do it that way. But what if instead, those with less power, those who are lower in the hierarchy, bless those above them? And what if those above them need what those below have to offer? What if that's how righteousness is fulfilled? 
What do you think? And in Matthew chapter 3, verse 15, we have the sentence that changed the entire world. John consented. John accepted the invitation. John was willing to allow his entire understanding of the world, of power, of God, of himself, to fly away in the wind. He consented to this vision of power. No longer a hierarchy, no longer a process of figuring out who's above who and who's below who, but now saw power as something to be shared in. What Jesus revealed to John is that God's ultimate desire is for every beloved person, every blessed creature that God creates, to share their power. In our language, we would call it relational power. It's not the power to influence and control other people. It's the power to live in relationship, to be changed as we change others, to be influenced as we influence, to love as we are loved. Jesus offered this invitation to John, and John consented. John said yes. What I was blown away by this week, I had never thought about it before. There are, according to some, more than 41,000 different Christian denominations in the world right now. 41,000 different ones. We are the United Church of Christ. There are 41, or what, 39,999 others out there, at least. And what we know for a fact is that every particular Christian community has always learned about, practiced, lived into their faith in different ways. So it's countless believers stretched across 2,000 years, spanning the globe, every continent, every country, every nation, every nationality, every type of person. And every single time, you know what the one requirement is to join this faith? Baptism. That's it. If you're baptized into the faith and body of Christ, you're one of us. And the powerful thing that just struck me this week is we don't have any stories of Jesus baptizing anybody. The act of baptism is an act of shared power. It's an initiation into an alternative way of being a human being where we opt out of this hierarchical power thing. We opt out of a power struggle and we opt into a life where we share power together. And we have John the Baptist to thank for that. Not Jesus. The one who was less than Jesus. I didn't become an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ because I am so powerful and wealthy and smart and more holy than you. Although, come on. No. <laughs> no, that's not why I became an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. I became an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ on the day that I gathered with my community in a small church in southern Arizona and a couple hundred people laid hands on me and one another to fulfill righteousness to say that we found the right way together. Together we are called to do the work that God has created us to do. I didn't become your pastor because I'm an expert in anything or because I know how church works and you don't or because I can preach the best. Although, come on, no. <clears throat> Although I did say, I said all those things to your search committee, believe it. <laughs> But that's not why I became your pastor. I became your pastor on the day that this church gathered together and in a democratic vote, voted, the majority voted to receive me as your pastor, as your preacher and teacher. To become a member of this community, you don't have to earn a certain amount of money. You don't have to have done amazing things in the world or in our community. You don't have to be anyone with a name or a reputation of any kind. The only thing you have to do to be a member of this community is consent. To consent to this project of sharing power with one another. 
of knowing that we can only fulfill righteousness, we can only find the right way together. It means that the gifts you have are just as important as the gifts I have. It means that you are blessed for the purpose of being a blessing to others. It means that justice only exists if we are being just ourselves. It means that we are called to deeper relationship with one another and God, and that is first and foremost what we do as church. It's a totally different way of being a human being. And it's the way we claim for ourselves. And I'm honored to share that work with each and every one of you. And now I'm going to invite us to receive some new members into our midst. I'd like to invite Mary and Pat and Nancy to come forward to the 